Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome you to today's panel titled Indigenous Archaeology and in Community Engaged Research in the Americas. Uh, my name is David Carvalho. I'm at BU in Anthropology, Archaeology, and Latin American Studies. I'm joined here today uh, by my colleague, Catherine West, who's also in Anthropology and Archaeology, and we'll be kicking off the Q&A section at the end of the panel. And then also our five panelists who are very excited to have with us today. We wanted to start by honoring and thanking the Massachusetts people who have stewarded this land for hundreds of generations. Boston University resides on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Massachusetts. And we acknowledge the painful history of forced occupation in their territory, as well in neighboring territories of the Wampanoag and Nipmuc. Today, our meeting place is still home to many Massachusetts people. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work and present in this territory. And our aspiration for this event is that it contributes in some small way to larger efforts at reconciliation. Panelists will also be incorporating acknowledgements appropriate to their spaces of work and research. And today's panelists critically engage issues of indigenous archeology span and working with local communities in North, Central and South America. They consider issues such as giving voice to indigenous knowledge production, decolonizing archeological institutions and practices and successes and challenges in working with diverse stakeholders with varied perspectives on historical memory. We'd like to thank a few BU programs and people for their support. The Department of Anthropology and in particular, Veronica Little, the archeology span program and Maria Sosa and the Provost's Office, and in particular, Crystal Williams and Abby Burmeister. On the left here, you can see the program for today. Everyone's going to be giving a presentation uh, of about 15 minutes. Um, and then we'll come back for the last half hour, 35 minutes for discussion and, uh, and questions and answers. So uh, Catherine will lead us off with those as well. At any point, um, you can ask a question at the bottom using the Q&A function. We are recording today's event so that we can share it with other interested parties who couldn't tune in at this time. And we're thrilled to have almost 200 registered um, attendees. Uh, we were supposed to have this last spring uh, before COVID. And, um, it, and you know, while we would like to be with all of you in person and share some food and drink, uh, you know, one benefit could be that, you know, that uh, we're reaching areas outside of Boston. And so we're grateful for that. Um, so if you have any questions at any point, please uh, put them in the Q&A link. If they're directed at one or more particular individuals rather than the whole group, it'd be helpful if you could uh, put that in the, in the question. And we'll hope to get to as many as possible uh, that we can at the end. Um, so let's get things started. I'm going to stop this and you'll see our, our panel of distinguished speakers today. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, them all. And we will start with uh, Daniela Raylard from Northwestern University, presenting education, engagement and employment, building the foundation for sustainable and collaborative archaeology in the Chapacoya region of Peru. Daniela, the floor is yours. Thank you. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, hopefully this works. I've practiced it a few times. Um, so can you all now see the PowerPoint? Yeah. Thanks, Bonnie. I see your reaction there. Perfect. Okay. And I'm just going to close this off here. Okay. Um, hello and thank you everyone. And thank you for the organizers to, uh, for inviting me to speak here today with you all. I'll be talking about my work in Northeastern Peru in the Chachapoya region. So I would like to begin my talk today by specifically acknowledging the land from which I speak, which is the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I also want to recognize their stewardship of this land, past and present, and their resilience despite the ongoing settler violence that was displayed last month. Algonquin land defenders faced backlash when they called for a moratorium on sport hunting to prevent further depletion of moose populations. For more information on this, please look up the hat hashtags that are shown here on the screen, and uh, I encourage you to check them out. 
The research I share with you today is shaped by my lived experiences and what I learned from living and working in Northeastern Peru. I grew up in, rural north, uh, in the rural north of so-called Canada. As you can see, this little snow bundle here is me. And my father is from Switzerland. He immigrated to Canada uh, for studies in biology, while my mother came to Canada from Colombia as a refugee. My mother played a huge role in teaching my sister and I about our heritage and our roots. And from this, I became very invested in learning about um, my more about my Indian heritage. So I decided to, to study archaeology and Latin American studies in undergrad. This is where I received the opportunity to travel to the northern Peruvian coast for my first field school uh, because my parents could afford to fund this trip. And here I made the connections that ultimate, ultimately led me to Chachapoyas, where I assisted on an archaeological project. Here I met my partner, Gigmar, and after living in Chachapoyas, I decided to go back to school for research. So many of the community members that I work with are my in-laws, extended family, and friends. As you can see here, my sister-in-law and my father-in-law. Over time, I've developed connections and re relationships between this immediate network, beyond this immediate network, and a central part of this project, as you'll see here, is trying to engage a broader network of community members and publics. So I'm constantly thinking about my position in relation to the communities that I work with, and I'd be more than happy to talk more about this in the Q&A section of today. From these relationships, one conversation always stood out to me. So a few years ago, I was in the field working with my father-in-law, and we were looking at uh, an archaeological site, and we're trying to figure out what was happening, as most of us, uh, we, we know very well in, in archaeology. Um, and I asked him what he thought, but he turned around and told me, you tell me you are the archaeologist. So I'm not sure if he was joking or not, and he does like to play a lot of pranks, but even so, this moment made me reflect on the process of knowledge production. And while my father-in-law has over a decade of experience in archaeology and guiding, often the researcher's interpretation are privileged over those of the lo local collaborators. And this power dynamic continues today and is often reinforced by researchers. This reflection has brought me to think through the work of Indigenous and feminist scholars who have advocated for the prioritization of Indigenous and local knowledge in the research practice, and also they've demonstrated methods to do so. So many of these I'm sure will be mentioned more uh, here today in this talk, Sonia Adelaide um, with her work in community-based archaeology. And for my project, this means trying to weave local knowledge, experience, and interest into every part of the research design. But this requires time, and this requires understanding local context. So to give you some more information on this local context, the Chachapoya region is located in northeastern Peru. As you can see here, uh, this gray blob is what archaeologists claim to be the extent of the Chachapoya region. It's named for the Chachapoya people, which um, are multiple ethnic groups with some shared cultural practices that emerged around 500 CE, but continued throughout the Inca and Spanish colonization. So this region was first colonized by the Inca in the 15th century, and then subsequently it was uh, colonized by Spanish invaders in the 16th century. Nevertheless, many locals today identify the Chachapoya as their antepasados, their ancestors, and some identify as descendants and as Chachapoya. You may have actually heard of this region before um, because of the site of Cuela. So this is shown here with this huge wall, this massive archeological complex. And today it's becoming more and more popular for tourism. Uh, they just built a huge cable car system here and it's being promoted as the Machu Picchu of Northern Peru. But the region is also known for other archaeological features beyond just Quelap. It's known for these above ground funerary structures. And the most famous of these sites is Laguna de los Condores, as you can see here, which was excavated in 1997 as part of a rescue project when the structures were found to be looted. Now, 219 mummy bundles that were rescued from the site are kept in a world class preservation facility managed by the Museo Comunitario de Leimebamba the Community Museum in Leimebamba, which is several kilometers away from Laguna de los Condores, and it's uh, Leimebamba is the main town and community in which I work. 
So the Chachapoya built these funerary structures all across the landscape. Pretty much if you see a limestone cliff face or a mountaintop, it's almost guaranteed that there will be a funerary uh, architecture associated with this place. Um, so in limestone cliff faces, they can contain up five, 10, or even hundreds of these structures. And they're more often built out of limestone masonry with clay mortar, plaster, paint, and wooden beams. So as you can see here, um, they often call these the honeycomb cliff faces because they're just pitted with all of this funerary architecture. But they also go beyond just uh, cliff mausolea. The, this funerary architecture can also take the form of anthropomorphic sarcophagi as seen here in the site of San Jeronimo. And in the same site, we get these uh, cliff mausolea. But from what you can see here, uh, evidently extremely destroyed. Uh, some time. They also occur on mountain slopes, so not just cliff faces, in the form of funerary towers, in the case of Papamarca, and I'll draw your attention to all of these uh, agricultural terraces that you can see here on the mountain slope and these road systems as well. So significant archaeological complexes with this in association with these funerary structures. In studying these above ground funerary sites, we also must be hyper aware of the cultural, historical, and ethical context. So while the Inca and then the Spanish colonizations have obscured the Chachapoya past, more recent events further complicate these sites' histories. So in the years following invasion, nearly all of these places were looted and many were burned. As you can see by the evidence of a burned um, charred beam from inside one of these structures. So many of these sites were, were burned in, uh, in order to rid these places of bad spirits, which is evident, evidently an effect of the introduction of Christianity. On top of all of this, um, we get uh, graffiti and drawing on these structures today. And there's also the legacy of amateur archaeologists and these self-proclaimed explorers who come into the region, such as the character of Jean Savoy. So in this case, he's notorious within local communities for having come in and stole and looted many of these archeological sites. And as a result today, archeologists today face a lot of skepticism and distrust because of these figures. And finally, as I mentioned before, the region's becoming extremely popular for tur tourism with the construction of a multi-million dollar cable car that's managed by international companies. Um, and part of this tourism industry is also a huge attraction is these above ground funerary sites. So many tourists come with an interest to uh, do treks and expeditions to these sites that are already severely destroyed and looted. So part of my project, um, as I think a central concern is for many of the speakers here, all the speakers here today is this issue of uh, bringing together academic research interests with those of the local community. So for me, I'm interested in studying the ecological and social relations that are maintained through these ancestral monuments. And after my time spending um, in this, this area, I've also learned that the local and descendant concerns are situated around sustainable rural tourism to counter the effect of these large scale companies coming in and managing tourist sites, um, assessment and conservation and revitalization of heritage places, and another concern is how to maintain heritage and transmit this heritage knowledge to youth, especially when so many are flocking to urban centers and leaving behind the rural countryside and often become disconnected from, from this heritage. So some ways that I'm thinking about incorporating all of these different questions and community concerns is first through the way that I'm working with people. Um, so I use participatory mapping techniques um, in which I work with local guides to identify, map, and document uh, funerary structures. So most of the times, this just means following my father-in-law, as you can see around uh, here on the horse, following him around on horseback and learning about these places. But it also means taking seriously local and descendant engagement with place and past. As well, last summer, we tried a new um, set of techniques in which we applied aerial drone photography to photograph and study above ground uh, funerary sites, especially those in cliff faces, which are really difficult to access. 
And this is also a more minimally invasive approach that we don't need to excavate or cause further destruction to these uh, sacred and, and um, important places. Another aspect of this project is the education initiative. So last summer um, at the Reimi Pampa Festival, which is an annual uh, festival that occurs every year in, in, in Leimi Bamba, we, there was one group of high school students who put on a skit, a dance, with the anthropomorphic sarcophagi, the mausolea, and um, some of the mummy, um, how do you call it, um, imitation mummy bundles. So I approached them to see if they would be interested in participating in a field trip to one of the large funerary complexes a few minutes away from, from Le Mibamba. And they were very excited to do so. So we did a field trip with many of these uh, night school students to La Petaca, which is about 40 minutes from Le Mibamba and has uh, 200 funerary structures in a single cliff face. Most of these students and professors had not been here before. And so we were sharing different mapping techniques we taught them how to use a GPS, but we're also talking about the site and, and learning about their own experiences with this place. Um, we also did a payment, a pago ceremony. So this is where we used coca leaves and liquor and tobacco to ask Pachamama uh, or Mother Earth for a good visit. And we finished off the day with a singing and dance party on the van ride home. So it was overall a pretty fun, a fun trip. Um, one engagement aspect that has become even more critical uh, now during the pandemic is the digital engagement initiatives. So I've been using social media platform of Facebook um, since Facebook is the most accessible so, uh, social media in, in rural Peru. Um, and with this Facebook page, the goal is to expand um, community network and also incorporate public opinions. And it's also a great tool for reaching the diaspora who have moved to urban centers. I plan on using this uh, Facebook page to post job opportunities, workshops, and promote project events for when I'm conducting the main portion of my dissertation research. And as a test run, we put together a, a short promotional video with drone photographs and videos um, and pictures from the archaeological survey. And we had a pretty positive reaction to this video. Um, it was especially fun to see, it's nice to see all of the comments um, that showed a lot of nostalgia and appreciation for people's homeland. And as you can see here, it was fairly widely circulated and a lot of uh, positive reactions. And another aspect of the digital engagement initiative is uh, this minimal, computer, minimal computing website that I'm building in collaboration with digital librarians at Northwestern. This is a bilingual website that's designed um, in its final form to be like an application that locals will be able to download onto their phone and access um, site guides, maps, uh, pictures for when they don't have good internet. So um, this one is, is still in, in, in the process, but this is this ultimate goal is to be accessible for these rural communities. And one final aspect of the project is developing this guidebook, um, keeping in mind local interest in developing sustainable rural tourism. We used maps and pictures to put together this uh, guidebook and printed off 10 to 15 copies, but they almost didn't make it into the hands of local guides just because there was so much interest. And on the bus ride home, I already gave away a few copies, um, but eventually we did manage to distribute a few of them to some of the guides and hopefully um, in the future, we'll be able to print and circulate it more widely. So from this talk today, just a few takeaway points to think of, and we'll talk about it more, I'm sure, in the question period, is how lived experience can shape research approach and community relations, um, and how the production of knowledge about the past needs to be done with community members rather than about them. We also have to consider the multiple layers of context and how that influences ethical research practices and sustainable long-term relationships. And finally, there's different ways to weave community concerns into these projects. And these are a few of the ways I'm thinking through the employee way I'm uh, working with people, education and engagement initiatives. So that, thank you so much for tuning in with us today. And uh, the alpaca here says, check out the Mapa Chachapoya Facebook page if you wanna learn more. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Daniela.
Um, I love that Facebook page and the Yama. So next up, we have Adriana Linares Palma from the University of Texas presenting on community-based archaeological program in San Juan Quetzal, Guatemala. Thank you. I'm going to share my screen now. Can you see it? Are you able to see my screen? Okay. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting on indigenous land and pay our respects to the Carrizo and Comecrudo, Coahuiltecan, Caro, Toncagua, Comanche, Lipan, Apache, Alabama, Cuxata, Kikapo, Tica Pueblo, Massachusetts, Wampanoag, and Nipuc, and all the American Indian and indigenous peoples and communities who have been or have become part of these lands and territories in Texas and Boston, here on Turtle Island. Also, I would like to acknowledge to the Maya issue people with whom I'm working for completing the research I'm sharing with you today. This presentation is about my dissertation research at Cozal, Guatemala. As the product of a request that the ancestral authorities of Cozal presented to me in 2013 for an archeological research in their territory. They saw in archeology span a resource to enhance their cultural and political objectives and support their social uh, movement and gauge towards indigenous self-determination. My dissertation draws from the colonial theory, methods and practices that emphasize collaboration between archeologists and local communities. I draw from indigenous archeologists, black feminist archeology span and intersectionality to discuss the politics of archaeological knowledge production in Guatemala. My research provides a survey and a collaborative mapping of sacred and post-classic archaeological sites of Quetzal. I examine the ways in which both Ishil and archaeological knowledge can engage in conversation to better illuminate our understanding of post-classic life. These dialogues are important given the historical tensions that exist between archaeological research and indigenous communities. The Ixil region has experienced structural violence since the Spanish invasion, and my research examines how to best mitigate the reproduction of colonial methodologies in a discipline that is based on the extraction of material artifacts, which indigenous communities consider sacred. So in this presentation, first, I explain the main results by placing in conversation archaeology and spiritual ways of knowing the past. Second, I address how we shaped the research in collaboration. And third, I provide a brief reflection on politics of research and, in the, and the importance of positionality. To explain entanglements of archaeology and spirituality, I examine the intersecting and tension points when placing Ishil local knowledge in conversation with archaeological knowledge. Giving a space to an epistemological perspective of both, this conversation guides us to understand to what extent one knowledge has been used over the other, but also how they can contribute to each other. Given that the Western knowledge has been recognized as the only and true, and also that it comes from the center state as the only valid perspective, my intention is to make visible the diversity of approaches and understandings of the past. Ishil knowledge has been excluded from the national history that relied only into the Western scientific approach. I highlight the importance of including it for a more complex, diverse and democratic process of approaching and studying the past. The intersecting point of both knowledges address the relationship between human settlements and their sacred landscape. 
On the one hand, the Xi people conceptualized the past through a constellation of Nach Bal or places or sacred places, and Totsot Kumam or the house of the grandparents, as places with special energies in the landscape. Such constellation is related to a cosmogonic order of places at regional and local levels. In the Ishu perspective, the Natbal evokes the words creation and the origin of the sacred fire, and the Totsos Kumam are the places in which the Ishu grandparents left their work for the coming generations. This network correlates to a system of Ishu sacred places of origin. On the other hand, the archaeological perspective examines the ball court's role as essential in the ritual activities at all Ishil ancient ceremonial centers. I use the concept of networks of power to study ceramics and architecture. By identifying local markers and foreign influences, I examine how the Ishil identity was formed which is characterized by having a small settlements with the ball courts as the main axis. I demonstrate that under shifting political alliances in the region, the shield incorporated foreign styles during the early post-classic and modified their settlement patterns as a response to the Quiche expansionism during the late post-classic period. However, such changes in their ceremonial centers maintain issue identity. Prior to the political tensions of the post-classic period, issues settled in direct contact with the river and water springs. Later, during times of conflict, the issues looked for places where they could watch over the landscape to control both basins and mountains. In this map, the yellow dots are the sacred places and the red triangles are the archaeological sites. Uh, here we can see the correlation to topography and uh, the relationship between sacred and uh, archaeological places. This epistemological conversation incorporates Ishil and archaeological knowledges as complementary to each other for a richer understanding of the Ishil sacred landscape, as these places remain the source of strength to shield spirituality today. I argue that ancestry is elemental to understand the shield sacred landscape in which memory and ancient materiality are one of the channels to maintain the Ticha Hill and shield philosophy and practice to the world's balance. I also underline the epistemologies of time as one contradiction or tension between these two opposed conceptualization and approaches. This is to visualize the power dynamics in the process of knowledge production. So on the one hand, archeology span understand, understands time linearly, separating the past from the present. On the other hand, the past for the issue people is non-linear and accessible from the present. In the context of Guatemala, the official national historiography praises the great Maya civilization belonging to a remote past, but refuses to connect and associate them to current Maya indigenous populations. The discourse about the common origin of Guatemalan citizens are the appropriation of history by the dominant sector and represent the way in which the stories, identities, and culture of the native peoples are erased, made invisible, and silenced. When the linear approach measures time, it presumes one narrow, long di dimension in which events are added chronologically. The concepts of pre-Hispanic or pre-Columbian support this idea, especially that of the unapproachable past only available through Western science. However, the issue nonlinear concept of time constantly connects people to the past as part of the present through memory and the practice of spirituality. When the nonlinear time doesn't measure it or doesn't conceive it in terms of chronological events, it embraces a connection to the origins. 
They should nonlinear understanding of time challenge the linear concept of history and its hegemonic uses. Its political use represents a constant revisiting to the origins, which are available at the sacred and archaeological places during the Maya ceremonies, but also through their daily practices. I argue that the linear use of time frame within the Guatemalan national discourse presupposes a temporal distance between the indigenous present and the materiality of the archaeological sites. Meanwhile, the issue nonlinear time claims indigenous rights to protect their sacred places, identity, and territory, also challenging the linear national discourses. So in this slide, as you can see on the right, we have an advertisement of the Maya, Museo Maya de America, that is using the national discourse that all Guatemalans uh, come from the same origin, which I think it's very problematic since the leader of the construction of this museum is a non-indigenous man who belongs to the oligarchy in the country. But we can talk more about this in the question and answer. The community-based research done in Cozal dictated the degree of involvement in various members of the community, of various members of the community, sorry, in a collaborative form, which included spiritual pedagogies and methodologies as essential contribution to the archaeological research, informing the sacred nature of the knowledge for the issues. This research is the result of four years of consultation and collaboration with the ancestral authorities of Cozal. Together, we design a methodology that ethically and respectfully approach the study of their sacred and archaeological sites, meaning not including excavations, but building a participatory mapping program. Also, students from the Ishil University became active participants and collaborators in the coll collection of data. We adopt and practice spiritual methodologies in our mapping program and including included the participation of the spiritual guides. They proposed to organize a series of Maya ceremonies asking permission to the ancestors and to the energies of the landscape. So we offered ceremonies for respect and protection before we started our mapping. As I say at the beginning, I, addre I address on politics of archeological research. We can't separate the methods that we implement in the field from research politics. So it is essential to have a clear political positionality. And part of my work is to underscore the threats that run through our participatory mapping. Since I was the coordinator of the mapping project, my presence as MUS, which is a Ishil word used to describe a person that doesn't speak Ishil or the foreign, created tensions and distrust among Ishin people. These experiences are related to the wound of the civil war of the 80s and the historical invasion, land displacement and violence lived in the Ishil region, all directly associated to elite Ladinos or non-indigenous from the city, white foreign people in the extractive industry. My experience at Cozal pushed me to define my political positionality in academia. Being a middle-class Ladino mestiza, born and raised in Guatemala City, guides me to be self-reflexive on the role of knowledge in our society. Class, race, gender, age, nation, among other identity markers or powers have completely intertwined in the politics of archeological knowledge in Guatemala. Thus, research processes can often be translated into power relation in which archeologists, especially Ladino or white foreign males, could form part of the dominant roles of the hierarchy. Workers are often hired to, provo to provide the labor force for the archeological excavations, and they usually are Ladino working class, peasants or indigenous males from nearby the sites. During archaeological fieldwork, it is common to hear that several archaeologists utilize pronouns such as mine, your, or their 
when talking about the workers. I argue that utilizing these types of expressions risk reproducing notions of plantation economy, a colonial legacy of racism, classism, and patriarchy in the country. I advocate for a critical archaeology that problematizes the power relationships according to each context of research, looking to not perpetuate colonialism through our methods. In this presentation, I provided a concrete example of how archaeology moves beyond the academic spheres to directly establish alliances with local organizations and social movements. There is a diversity of understandings and feelings about the shield past, and the practice of decolonization is to build awareness of the importance of the importance to maintain both knowledges in conversation seeking a contribution to the understanding of both perspectives. My ethical and methodological approach is crucial in demonstrating respectful ways of conducting archaeology, especially in consultation with ancestral authorities, as well as obtaining local perspectives, which are crucial in understanding post-classic issues, society, culture, and life. So I want to finish by thanking David Carvalho for coordinating this event. It's an honor to be part of this panel and thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Adriana. Um, next up, we have Wade Campbell from Harvard discussing the early Navajo Pastoral Landscape Project, an archeological study of Diné herding traditions. All right. Um yeah it's on also Shay Wade Campbell Yunisha Kiani Nishlin Bilagana Bush Chin Tla Hundred Dash Chao the Bilagana Dashanella Akut Ego Dinahatin Nishlin. Um hello my name is Wade Campbell. I am a Navajo archaeologist and a member of the Navajo Nation. I'm currently a PhD student studying um at Harvard and I am uh very excited today to be a part of this uh, symposium and presenting from the lands of the Akimalodam and Pipash here in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, what I'm going to talk today, uh, what I'm going to talk about today concerns my dissertation research, which um, focuses on attempting to better understand the history, scope, and impacts of sheep herding uh, by Navajo people in the American Southwest. Um, but with that in mind, with, with, uh, in, in the setting of the symposium, I, I figured one of the first things to do might be to sort of lay out how I think of kind of the organizing topic of this, of this gathering, which is indigenous archaeology. And for me, I tend to think of it in this way, right? That archaeology is commonly defined as the systematic study of the human past through material remains, or through a focus that emphasizes material remains. Um, and an indigenous archaeology is this, which is conducted with, for, and by indigenous peoples. And, and in this regard, I've been, I had always been uh, inspired by the work of Sonia Adelaide, an Anishinaabe archaeologist, um, and particularly uh, an early set of papers that she and other native archaeologists had worked on um, back in 2006. And the interesting thing about this definition, though, I think is that while it's incredibly useful, I think in some ways, too, it's a, a tad vague. And so you'll see on the right hand side of the screen that I've sort of broken this out a little bit into the ways in which I think about these topics, you know, what does with, for, and by mean? Um, and I think, you know, what does an indigenous methodology um, consist of and what does it mean to decolonize? And so with this in mind here, having a focus on native research or collaborative research that engages with tribal histories and, and tries to innovate, and in doing so challenges traditional archaeological narratives, traditional historical narratives, and, and you know, to echo Adriana, sort of recenters these political um, impacts that are associated with one's work, I think that is, that is key. And so for me, when I talk about uh, when I talk about this, um, 
it's in the eyes of uh, my experience as a Navajo person who grew up in the Four Corners um, and is very much uh, invested in the, the history of, of the Navajo Nation in particular. And so what this map shows is where different aspects of my dissertation project have uh, taken place with the first phase of work over here taking place on Black Mesa in the middle of the Navajo Nation but also subsequent phases have taken place off the reservation and in this area here um, in the upper right hand corner of the map, which is the area known as the Neta or the traditional uh, ancestral Navajo homeland. My work focuses on this aspect of Navajo culture um, <laughs> that some people have described as sheep mindedness, uh, previous anthropologists have. And, and uh, basically sort of emphasizing the role in which uh, sheep and goat herding have really played a key part in popular conceptions of Navajo culture, both within the Navajo community and uh, for outsiders. Um, and this extends to, uh, there are nonprofits like the Navajo Lifeway, which emphasize the role of uh, sheep and herding um, in traditional activities. Uh, simple things that are uh, frequently linked to iconic Navajo crafts like weaving and rugs have their roots in this herding tradition. Um, and it's something that people today in the 21st century frequently refer to even as as you can see in this in this uh, sort of graph here, this timeline, um, in currently contemporary Navajo society, uh, herding is actually relatively rare. And so with this in mind, uh, one of the things that it's always interested me is how, given the importance it plays within uh, Navajo society and the sort of social fabric of Navajo communities, understanding how it starts in the wake of um, Spanish colonialism in, in the Southwest and those links and its, its growth, uh, Navajo people accepting it, adopting it and really making it their own, that's not actually very well understood. And so that forms the focus of, of my dissertation research. Um, now the interesting part is that in terms of Navajo archeology, span we actually have a decent handle on this sort of early period um, the Spanish colonial period in the Southwest. And we understand that uh, Navajos were engaged in, in many of the traditional activities uh, that they continue to do now. Um, but there are some interesting uh, sort of unique moments, right? We know that people are building these fortresses within the Dineta region. They're also constructing traditional Hogan dwellings. And we know a lot about what kind of ceramics they use and, and the trade that they were involved in. But archaeology has proven unsuccessful pretty much in, 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 a, in being able to grasp uh, what the effects of pastoralism are and how intensive these herding activities have been. And so with that in mind, I uh, tried to think of a project that dove at this question what were Navajo herding practices like circa 1700 and and how did Navajo communities manage the impacts associated with adopting these these animals learning the practices needed to take care of them making them and eventually making them their own such that it becomes the 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 key factor um, in understanding Navajo life today and so to do so I, I developed a, a three-phase project, which I am now engaged in the last bit here, phase three. But I figured I'd walk through this to sort of demonstrate what, how I think an indigenous archaeology project could be done um, in ways in which um, the work has, has the potential to highlight things that have, have uh, been obscured in the past by uh, traditional approaches. And so in this regard, the first part uh, consisted of ethno-archaeological work, basically six months of <laughs> working with my extended family to herd sheep um, 
on Black Mesa. Uh, and the goal of this, this ethno-archaeological survey work was twofold. The first was, as you can sort of see on this uh, map that is um, playing uh, on the right, that the key part of this was to gain experience in, in actually understanding what it means to work with sheep, to uh, move through the landscape, um, to address their, their wants, their needs, as well as how um, a, a families um, use these animals um, and, and can make a livelihood from them. And in doing so, uh, to try to identify those um, material characteristics, those archaeological signatures that could help understand how these events were playing out in the past and how archaeologists could actually recognize them if you go further into the past. And so by focusing on historic and contemporary Navajo herding practices and identifying sort of site layouts and the like, as this photograph on the upper left shows uh, an example of a Navajo herding camp, a Navajo sheep camp with a, a hogan, a traditional habitation structure, an outbuilding, and a, a large corral built up against this uh, rock wall. Um, by doing this, I was able to generate a set of characteristics that, that helped me think about ways in which people may have done this in the past. And by going and actually sort of distilling down some of these characteristics and in, in, uh, investing in a, a series of geospatial modeling tasks to identify uh, potential site locations for uh, herding areas, I was able to use the ethno-archaeological information to uh, generate a, a model that could help me plan work that focuses more on this earlier period. And so the this earlier period, right, is this Dineta region that I mentioned earlier. And this third phase of work focused on surveying, uh, sort of a traditional archeological survey and sampling process at these older sites, the sites that date to the late 16 and early 1700s, and which correspond to the period when the Spanish uh, were in New Mexico and interacting with Navajo people, and which we know to some degree Navajo people were um, involved in, in this hurting process. And so uh, with this model in hand, with these observations and experiences uh, in my mind, I went out to Dineta and looked at a series of sites of which the, a few are shown here. And some of these sites were Pueblitos, like the Morris One uh, Pueblito, which is seen here on the right. But a number of others were sort of normal everyday habitations, you know, consisting of these traditional um, non-fortress habitation sites. But because it actually, it looks kind of nice, but it also gives a nice illustration of some of the issues at play, right? At these sites, um, very little excavation has been done in the past. And uh, arguably it's not a particularly productive approach for looking at uh, short-lived um, semi-mobile occupations. And so what I decided to do instead was um, conduct a, a traditional archaeological survey recording features and the like, but augmenting it with a, with a, a simple geochemical survey to get a sense of the subsurface uh, features of these sites. And in doing so, I was sampling both the, the sort of surrounding landscape as well as features of interest, like this midden here, uh, this stone, this block of uh, these uh, stone blocks which seem to indicate a room below this fortress here. And you can actually see this in the, uh, this is the same site as in the previous photo. In using this information, uh, conducted a series of uh, analyses on these soil samples, first being a, a phosphorus analysis, uh, categorizing the total phosphorus content of these soil samples to better understand how they might um, how they might reflect uh, subsurface activities associated with corralling or trash disposal and the like, and you, as you can see, some of these areas are actually quite interesting. And so the the last phase of work, which is uh, currently underway, consists of looking at um, 
microscopic remains associated with animal dung to see if I can confirm this identification that some of these areas may or may not be animal pens. And the goal with this is to, um, if I can identify pens, then I can actually have a better handle on the degree to which people were invested in the management of these animals um, and the ways in which local communities, small pockets of sites were actually sort of interacting with each other to um, incorporate them into what had previously been the, the traditional Navajo lifestyle. And so, like I said, some of this is underway, but uh, with the focus on the main question being, and uh, what are the what have what were the impacts of incipient herding practices among early Navajo communities? That is, I, I don't have a clear answer. But what is clear from the ethnoarchaeological work and actually just engaging in this three-part research process has been that uh, working, in my case, with family, but even just working on. Um, issues related to historic or more recent uh, indigenous experiences is something that is frequently overlooked, um, at, least in, uh, at least in historical archaeology in, in the US Southwest. But there's a lot of potential for using these methods to look at various issues associated with key events um, that have otherwise been ignored. And the other interesting uh, aspect has been that by choosing not to excavate, um, out of respect really for um, these sites and, and a sense of, of um, wishing to do really a, a, um, create as, as little impact as possible. Other techniques, other approaches have, have risen to the fore, you know, survey, yes, but and, and um, ethno arc and participant observation, but also tools like remote sensing uh, satellite imagery analysis, drone analyses, uh, soil chemistry, and uh, micro um, micromorphological analyses, and in this way, I think it's it's a it's a really interesting um, sort of set of techniques that I think, in my case, avoid some of these theoretical dead ends in in Navajo archaeology in the past, and. Um, it's bringing to light really kind of fascinating new issues. So, as I said, to, to reiterate, I think this actually is a nice example of what I think indigenous archaeology has to offer folks on, on, on a larger scale, right? That you, um, by accepting potential limitations, by centering native knowledge, uh, you get um, a really uh, powerful new tool set that I think encourages really interesting new work and um, highlights aspects of, of indigenous histories that have, have been um, really hidden or ignored over the years. And uh, in doing so, I think archeology span emerges stronger for it because the, the as I sort of have on the slide, the, 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 the personal, the local experience is put into broader conversation. I think for um, indigenous communities, this is actually a key part of the research process. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking more about this with everybody um, after this. So uh, thank you. And um, my thanks to my family, my friends, and everybody who's uh, supported this work. So, all right. Many thanks, Wade. And Wade's Twitter handle is looking for number four mutton. And now you can see why. So it's a pleasure to see that. Uh, next up, we have Dr. Caitlin Alcantara from Indiana University talking about recipes of belonging, adapting what our ancestors gave us. Thank you. Okay, um, let's see, it looks like I don't have subtitles. That's right. Um, thank you for organizing this panel and to everybody who's on it. I've really enjoyed listening to uh, all of the presentations and I'm excited because there's so many things that we have 
in common. So I feel like I'm in the right place and with the right people to kind of start thinking about some of these ideas. Um, I titled my presentation Recipes of Belongings, Adapting What Our Ancestors Gave Us. And the image that I have on this first uh, slide is of my father's hands making a torta. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what my particular family uh, background is and how that influenced um, some of the things that I'll be talking about today. Um, I want to acknowledge that uh, today I'm presenting from the land of the Miamiaki, uh, Lenape, Bodwawagmik, and Sawana people. Um, and I also will be talking about um, a project that was done in Tlaxcala, which is an area of Nahuatl, Otomi, and Totonaca populations. Um, and I'm talking about, I'm making these acknowledgements because there's so much information that already exists by communities that I think we don't take into account when we're looking at these stories of the past. Um, when we think of archaeology, and I think some of my colleagues have also talked about this uh, as something that's looking at an ancient past, um, we forget to acknowledge that this past is built on a present that continues to exist and a present that was shaped by uh, colonization and ignoring that history and the way that we engage with it every day on a daily basis is something that perpetuates erasure and silencing. And so when I was pulling together this slide, um, I was really excited. I just moved to Indiana and Bloomington. Um, and so this is a new area that I'm getting to know, but I was really excited to see how much work is already being done. So I think um, as we're doing this work, wherever we are in the universities, we are learning about these histories that the lands we are in um, really helps to shape the way that we're looking at the past as well. So in my presentation, um, I want to state from the get-go that it's not really an archaeological data presentation. It's more of a reflection on my work. Um, I'm happy to present more on the archaeological data if you're interested in that um, during discussion or if you have any additional questions. But really, I'll be talking about positionality and how to really think through um, our role as archaeologists and how we engage with this uh, continuous history instead of placing archaeology in a deep past and us in a present unearthing it. So um, my title is about how how we look at the past and consider it the way that has shaped the present. Um, and as some of my colleagues presented similarly looking at positionality, how we understand the way that our own stories have shaped capacity about the past. We're all archaeologists for a reason. There's something about looking into the deep past that's interesting to us. But um, I think this reflection is really important to untangling why. Uh, archaeology has a very strong colonial history. Um, a lot of its origins are about, you know, uh, claiming discovery and a collection of objects and individuals. Um, and this has shaped a particular belief about the way the world is structured, a way about the, the possibilities for archaeology, about our role in uh, relationship to other communities in the world. So I want to start with this kind of reflection about what beliefs do we inherit from our family systems um, and how do they position us within the world? What kinds of stories do we inherit from our family systems or from our community systems? And how do we work to, to use archaeology to disentangle ourselves from this colonial legacy. Um, so to give just a little bit of context for myself, um, I was born in Mexico City uh, to a Mexican father and a um, mother from the United States. Um, and I think that my relationship to archaeology has had a lot to do with the recognition of the landscape that I spent a lot of time on in this particular picture. This is our backyard of volcanic rock and lots of uh, cacti around and just recognizing how uh, relationship to place ends up becoming entangled with um, all the other parts of history that have happened in that pace, place. And so kind of reflecting on that as we think about why we're doing archaeology in the places that we are. One of the things that I used in my dissertation to think through this positionality is something that I call the bioecological model. Um, this is based off of a model by Yuri Bronfenbrenner, which was a, um, a model intended to understand child development um, and pedagogy. So in this model, there's one, the, the center is an individual, and from your individual self, you experience the world in a certain way based on your body, based on your identities, um, and those create a sense of 
understanding, which is then interacting with the groups around you. So people like your family, people like your coworkers, people like your university system. Um, and then there are external factors that shape all of that, things like the economy, um, things, like, things like states and countries. And even beyond that is this idea of an ideology or a worldview, a way that the world functions that you are agreeing to. But this is always in flux and it can always be adapted. And one of the things that this has helped me understand is this link from what we call the archeological past to the present. So in particular with my work in Mexico, it helps me understand how this archeological past um, was the trajectory to the present was shaped really strongly by colonialism, by a complete restructuring of worldview and shifting of how individuals saw themselves, how they fit into society, what society looked like. And this is happening both on indigenous and Spanish colonizer sides. And then even looking further to how this has shaped the way that we look at archeology span in Mexico and in the United States in this globalized world. Um, but also understanding that the archaeology that we're doing in the places that we're studying have very specific uh, context specific stories of conquest and imperialism. So understanding those is also really important to understanding this trajectory to the present. Using this idea of trying to connect the deep past to the present, uh, my research archaeologically is in Tepetikpak, Tlaxcala, uh, in the late post-classic period just prior to the arrival of the Spanish. Um, I also will be talking a little bit about uh, contemporary Tlaxcala and then Nashville, Tennessee, which is where I did my graduate work. I'm linking all of these by looking at food as a way to tap into memory and storytelling and history and tracing how uh, the experiences that I look at in the archaeological site uh, also reflect stories that are carried through into the present and how integrating community knowledge helps me understand that. So I just have a couple of slides that are a little archaeology heavy and this is uh, one of them just to orient where I'm talking about. So my work, as I mentioned, is in late post-classic central Mexico. Um, and this area was interesting to me because uh, growing up in Mexico, there is a strong nationalist Mexican identity that is based on this idea that we are all Aztecs. Um, and so it's different from the United States because indigeneity, at least in the way that it's been co-opted by the state, is very present in word names of streets, in different types of foods. Um, and, but this idea of having a common identity when there was a broad diversity of indigenous groups um, in the pre-Hispanic past and continue to be uh, present in the, in the contemporary era um, is something that erases this multiplicity of experiences and really homogenizes it. Um, and so my focus was on a site that was in this history kind of the enemy of the Aztecs, the anti-Aztec uh, site that resisted Aztec empire um, and Tlaxcala was the, the last area to resist the Aztec Empire in the central area and consequently ended up becoming uh, the ally for the Spanish and leading the Spanish to um, conquer the rest of, of Mexico. And in the history of Mexico, Tlaxcala has almost become a joke. Um, it is ignored and even though it's just two hours outside of Mexico City, um, very few people acknowledge that it exists. It's one of the smallest states because it had a privileged position with uh, the Spanish and was able to maintain a certain level of indigenous autonomy um, in ways that didn't happen in other parts of, of Mexico. But even more than that, uh, within the history of Mexico, I believe that Tlaxcala represents a challenge to this narrative of unified identity. It's a concrete example of the way that um, multiple storylines exist and what those storylines can can cause to happen to um, kind of colonial projects. So in my research, I was interested in understanding how um, Tlaxcala was able to resist. And so I teamed up with excavations with the Proyecto Arqueológico Tepetikpak. Um, and this was a five-year project that um, I was a part of for 2015, where we excavated burials from, from the site. And this is a project aimed at site restoration. So um, the project resulted in a, in a total number of um, 53 burials. Um, and what I got from analyzing dietary isotopes was a whole bunch of data. And so this, this slide is intentionally really overwhelming. 
um, because I'm trying to portray how from this analysis, what I got was a bunch of information and numbers that was hard to tie to lived experiences, to real information. To give you a summary of how I ultimately interpreted this, um, the Plaska, the population at Tepetikpak was a population that was eating very high C4 photosynthetic pathway plants. A lot of them are known as, um, maize is one of the ones that most is most commonly known, but um, through my research, I also found that probably cacti were part of those and um, other C4 plants like amaranth. So uh, really heavy reliance on local plant foods and um, a really homogeneous diet. And so through other data that I can talk to you about if you're interested, what I interpreted was this population was uh, working with a strong knowledge of the landscape to be able to feed the population in uniform ways as everybody is kind of clustered around the same type of diet. And I hypothesized that that was probably something that helped be able to resist an uh, empire that was um, blockading um, blockading different uh, food sources from being able to enter. But beyond looking at the data there, um, as I was doing my field work, I was in Mexico for a, about a year and every day I would have to go find somewhere to eat. So I would talk to the señoras at the Comida Corrida and I would go to the market on the weekends and I joined a dance class. And when I would start to tell people about my work and just talk to them as people, not necessarily as an academic telling a public, um, I found that there were a lot of people who were excited and interested in this idea of using food to understand something about our past, something about, um, about what uh, experiences that in the past could have looked like. And this unscripted engagement made me really aware of the ways in which curiosity and interest in the ancient past is really tied to a broader human interest in constructing narratives about who we are. Um, so in talking to people, in particular, I am a very big plant lover, so I ended up talking to a lot of people who also work closely with plants. Many of them um, are identify themselves as Nahuatl, as indigenous to the area. Um, but through these conversations, I was able to add uh, kind of like Wade was talking about, about linking to contemporary experiences, this relationship to landscape, this relationship to food and really understand what it would have meant in the past to, um, to be so closely dependent on the landscape that I was in the same, the same place at, um, in a different time. And one of the examples of how this helped me interpret my data in a way that was a lot more uh, textured than I would have known on my own was uh, understanding that this heavy maze in the diet, it was something that I showed up in, um, in children and in infants as well. And so trying to understand how, how children and infants could be eating corn, um, talking to some people some friends, uh, they commented that often uh, atole, which is a, a gruel made out of uh, maize or out of amaranth, is something that's consumed at all stages of life to um, help with weaning, to help with breast milk flow. And so adding these stories as texture. Um, another outcome of these conversations was that I uh, became very close with members of the alternative agroecological market in Tlaxcala and Mercado Alternativo. And this is a market that is centered around um, agroecological farming. So farming without pesticides, farming in small scales, farming as a way to share knowledge and history. And um, in large part, this is a response to GMO farming that is coming into the area and um, taking away autonomy over the landscape. Um, and in, in doing so, also taking away many of the stories that are associated with the landscape and a lot of the relationships that people have um, historically with the space. And so um, talking to this population, I found that um, a lot of my work was also, it, it could also be used to further the narratives that they were arguing for in a project that was already started. Um, so their work is really arguing for this idea that um, being able to control food is more than just feeding yourself. It's about being able to control stories. It's a being able to control history um, and identity. And so being able to provide the archeological data that I had that you know um, 
was going to be destined for publications and things that were very much in the academic sphere, being able to provide that as something that could support their arguments um, and that could also help interpret or support a lot of the movements that they were doing within the market, which depended on going and using a lot of recipes, a lot of ingredients that were pre-Hispanic really gave, um, we were able to kind of collaborate in that way and where they would help me understand my data and I would help support a lot of their, um, their arguments. And then a final part of my work has been that I think we don't talk about enough how divided we are as archeologists in terms of where we occupy space. Um, how we are archaeologists in a particular area for a field season, but then spend a large amount of time in our home institutions. And so for me, my home institution um, at the time of this project was Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, and being able to connect with individuals when I was doing my field work and really discuss these ideas of how archaeology can go beyond just archaeology to have broader conversations, about identity um, helped me to envision when I was back in Nashville ways to use that knowledge to also help communities in Nashville. So I began a cooking workshop that was in part um, helping me uh, find a, a cultural connection, but also helping students from Latin America in Nashville um, reconnect with memories and histories that they had been separated from as well. And I think throughout all of this, um, this collecting stories from individuals, collecting experiences from individuals. Um, this is an example of one of the activities we did where we uh, reflected on different foods that were familiar to us. And you can see that even children from these foods are, are showing how they have so much memory and knowledge about space through food and through time. Um, and so these recipes and the, this idea of using food to traverse time and to connect different um, experiences and brought in archaeology to be something that is both decolonial um, and culturally or politically relevant in the moment um, ties back to the idea of um, the bioecological model of how we exist at a center. We have particular identities and experiences and thoughts um, that shape us. But as we begin to expand those, as we begin to expand other stories, um, and be, begin to listen and slow down to other experiences, we can expand our own spheres of interpretation as well, and perhaps use archeology span not just as a producer of data, but as a way to heal, to create equity, and to support concrete community needs. So thank you um, all for listening, for um, all of the colleagues on the panel. Um, and yeah, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me um, as well. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, and so finally, uh, for the panel, it's a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Bonnie Newsom from University of Maine, uh, who'll be talking about indigenous archeologies and climate change resilience lessons from Pas uh, Passamaquoddy homeland, but also then reflecting on the papers, uh, the previous four papers and, and, and bringing some synthesis. After that, we'll move to the question and answer. There are some that have appeared already um, and uh, Catherine West will, will kick us off with those. So Bonnie, the, I th or Caitlin, I think we still are seeing your slide here. We we'll just do stop share and then Bonnie will share. Great, thanks. All Bonnie, right, take thank it away. you everybody. Bear with me, folks. Um, can you see my screen? We can see it, Bonnie, but the sizing seems to be off. So I don't know. Sometimes you can just stop share and reshare or. All right, I'll do that.
How was that? Now we're seeing your desktop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How was that? Ah, perfect. We got okay. it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, let me minimize this. Get rid of this. Okay, now that we've gotten through that, um, thank you so much for inviting us today and thanks for everybody who's attending. Um, I'd li also like to thank uh, David and Catherine and the BU administration for setting this all up. Um, I'm presenting today from uh, the University of Maine at Orono, uh, which is located in uh, Penobscot Nation homeland where um, issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are really ongoing. Um, Penobscot homeland connects to other uh, Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, uh, Mi'kmaq, and Abenaki through uh, kinship, alliances, friendships, uh, and diplomacy. Um, the Penobscot nation, like other uh, Wabanaki tribal nations, are distinct, sovereign, legal, uh, and political entities um, and with our own powers of self-governance and self-determination. And I'd also like to preface this presentation by acknowledging um, my Wabanaki ancestors for their responsible care and stewardship of the lands, um, the waters, our traditions, and um, cross-cultural relationships in our homeland. So in terms of my background, um, I'm a citizen of the Penobscot Nation, a member of the Fisher clan, and I work as a Northeast archeologist in the Humane Anthropologies Department, and I'm also affiliated with the university's Climate Change Institute. Um, prior to taking uh, the position here at Humane, I served um, as a uh, tribal historic preservation officer for 10 years at Penobscot Nation. Um, and there I, I really felt that that's where my community archeology span um, approach was uh, um, born. Uh, I've never done anything other than community archeology. span And so um, this notion of indigenous archeologies span kind of came along after I had started. Um, I'm also uh, a mother of four and a grandmother of two new grandsons and uh, some days I think they are my greatest contributions to the world. Uh, today, um, the topics I will cover include um, a brief review of some of the cultural dimensions of climate change and a discussion of climate change impacts as they pertain particularly to indigenous peoples um, and heritage. And then I'll share with you some details of uh, the University of Maine's collaboration with the Passamaquoddy tribe on an indigenous archeology span project in Machias Bay, which is in down East Maine. Very often when we think of um, the cultural dimensions of climate change, we think about how our behavior may cause or possibly help mitigate climate change impacts. And in a 2013 paper, Adger et al. highlighted the uh, cultural dimensions of uh, climate change, noting that culture is embedded in really multiple facets of climate change. Our economies, our lifestyles, our politics and social structures are all tied to how we as humans deal with uh, climate change and climate change impacts um, on our community. And so as humans, the cultural context within which uh, we operate shape uh, our mitigation efforts and influence our perspectives. And so our ability to adapt to changing climates or to be resilient in the face of climate change impacts are culturally influenced as well. Um, today, I really wanna focus on uh, this notion of uh, resilience um, and uh, indigenous resilience in particular. And I use um, this definition of resilience, which is from uh, Wong and Parodi, uh, who state that resilience includes the ability to acquire new capabilities, perhaps emerging stronger from the struggle. And there's no doubt that um, indigenous archeology span um, has a, a connection to um, building stronger communities, I think as we've seen in some of the um, talks that uh, have gone previously. Um, 
there's no doubt that loss and damage um, is part of really the climate change struggle. Um, as archaeologists, this is one area where we can uh, play an active role, particularly with regard to what's referred to non, as non-economic loss and damage. Um, and this is the loss of both material and non-material items that are uh, not commonly traded in the market, but whose loss is still experienced by, um, by those who are affected. And our cultural spaces uh, and practices are an example of this, and Indigenous communities are particularly vulnerable to this type of loss. So there are um, many reasons for this, um, including Indigenous peoples live in vulnerable environments and they are tied to place um, for the long term often uh, across multiple generations. Uh, the life ways and cultures of Indigenous peoples um, are often intimately connected to natural resources and all of this is compounded by um, a social and economic and political marginalization. And um, as a result, climate change effects on indigenous communities um, are dis disproportionate um, to other communities often. And we're seeing this in Maine, particularly as um, it uh, relates to coastal um, heritage. So Maine is home to roughly 2,000 coastal heritage spaces, um, uh, and these represent roughly 5,000 years of um, native families living on the coast. Most of these sites um, or archaeological um, uh, spaces are shell-bearing sites where uh, folks in the past deposited large quantities of uh, a mollusk shell, and these are um, severely threatened by climate change related impacts such as sea level rise, um, increased storm intensity, and uh, an increase in kind of these freeze thaw cycles that occur seasonally. And so um, for Maine's indigenous uh, communities, uh, coastal shell bearing sites really are um, remnants of a built heritage that help tell the story of our ancestors and our cultural connections uh, to place. But these uh, places are often marginalized in that they're not afforded the same attention as um, the built heritage of settler societies. Marginalization of uh, Maine's coastal shell bearing sites renders indigenous pasts often socially invisible and contributes contributes to the historic erasure of Maine's ind indigenous peoples. And you can see this quote, I love this quote, deterioration or disappearance of any item of, of the cultural or natural heritage constitutes a harmful impoverishment of the heritage of all the nations of the world. And that's out of the 1972 UNESCO Convention on um, the Protection of Cultural and Natural Heritage. Um, and so, to confront this kind of marginalization here, um, the Northeast Archaeology Program at the University of Maine has committed to a research agenda that supports research on coastal uh, shell bearing sites, um, really with an emphasis on um, meeting the cultural needs of indigenous peoples and supporting indigenous values and agendas. Um, a case in point that I'm talk going to talk about today is uh, uh, the Passamaquoddy Humane Partnership centered on the Holmes Point West site in Machias Bay. Um, the uh, Passamaquoddy people um, uh, are uh, the easternmost native community in the, in, in, uh, the U.S. Um, they are one of several Wabanaki tribes um, and Wabanaki translates loosely to or people of the dawn or people of first light. Um, the Passamaquoddy uh, uh, are, uh, have two reservations in, um, in the United States and um, they also have a, a community in New Brunswick. So they're a cross border uh, community. They're very active in um, their uh, heritage and cultural 
uh, preservation efforts and um, they have a robust language retention program underway. And because of their cultural ties to the coast, um, they've been active in um, heritage preservation of uh, coastal spaces. So um, in working with the Passamaquoddies, one of the sites that we've worked on is the Holmes Point West site. And um, this site is situated you can see here on a moderately uh, sloped hillside, and it's currently threatened by erosion, as are many of these um, shell bearing sites on the coast. But it's part of a cultural landscape, which includes multiple archaeological sites, and most of which date to the last um, 3000 years. And uh, this site in particular is located on private property, um, and there's a conservation easement, which Maine Coast Heritage Trust holds. Um, on the parcel. Um, so there's some level of protection. Um, also, you'll see that there's um, uh, an extensive uh, clam flat um, environment located at the site, at the front of the site, um, providing uh, um, and contemporary clammers still work here today and um, as did people in the past. Um, additionally, this cultural landscape is enriched by the presence of some of the region's most impressive and important um, indigenous, indigenous petroglyphs and petroglyphs uh, featuring animal and human motifs are uh, carved into the exposed bedrock adjacent to the site um, at Holmes Point West. And humane research at this location has evolved over the years, um, as has community engagement. In the 1970s, um, humane undertook archaeological and petroglyph research at this location, um, and there was no apparent communicate community engagement at that time. Um, when Maine archaeologist Brian Robinson returned to the area in 2008, he instituted a strong indigenous community engagement um, project or component to his research. Um, and Dr. Robinson passed away in 2016, sadly, and I'm um, in here, I'm uh, now attempting to carry on this legacy of a vibrant, a vibrant community engaged archeology span program. In uh, 2019, we partnered with the Passamaquoddy tribe on a uh, field school that integrated an indigenous archeology span framework and placed a special emphasis on uh, community engagement and a public service component linked to the tribe's um, language preservation efforts. Um, so I'm just gonna go quickly through these next couple of slides for time. Uh, this, the site has a deep time relationship between peoples and place and uh, like many sites in Maine, uh, lithics and stone, uh, excuse me, uh, ceramics and bone uh, tools are, are common. And also you can see here that uh, cultural features are, um, are evident at the site and represent activities of uh, past families. Um, additionally, the site um, has a, a additional, our settler heritage is well represented at the site uh, with both French and um, English material culture that per, present here. Um, but when we're talking about resilience um, in the face of climate change, we really have to talk about uh, the Passamaquoddy people and their active engagement with this as a cultural space. We're all aware of um, the cultural loss that's occurring at this location, but um, the Passamaquoddy community has really taken a proactive role in strengthening their culture um, and community uh, through engagement with um, archaeologists, as well as engagement with this space. And um, one of the uh, examples of this is uh, the Equinox Petroglyph, Petroglyph Project, which showcases the petroglyphs through the lens, uh, lenses of women and, and children artists. And you can see here is uh, an example of some of the children's arts that, that's linked to the petroglyph sites. Um, additionally, uh, uh, Passamaquoddy community routinely brings uh, their young people to the site and to our field school. And that's been an active um, piece of uh, our field school offerings. Um, and also in a kind of a related um, 
effort, uh, the Passamaquoddies were successful in negotiating the return of five acres of coastal property um, across the bay. Um, and those also have where there's five acres there roughly that have um, a petroglyph, uh, uh, um, a petroglyph site on them as well. So that uh, is one aspect of, um, you know, kind of reconnecting with that that cultural space. <clears throat> and so our field school really uh, complements these efforts in a variety of ways. We host visits, um, as I mentioned, of uh, the school. Um, our students also visit uh, the Passamaquoddy Museum um, and interact uh, almost daily with um, Passamaquoddy tribal members. Donald Soctoma, who is here uh, uh, trying out the atlatl, um, is a champion for um, uh, community engagement around archaeology, and he's uh, the tribal historic preservation officer. He's um, really a fabulous person and um, has worked really hard to uh, help bridge connections between um, archaeology and um, contemporary uh, community members. So one of our most meaningful aspects of the 2019 Field School was uh, the Passamaquoddy Language Project. And uh, field school students were assigned um, a language video project whereby they worked uh, with Dwayne Toma, who is here. Um, uh, and Dwayne is a fluent speaker of Passamaquoddy. And through that interaction, the students uh, created language videos linked to the Holmes Point West site um, that could then be used in uh, the Passamaquoddy Youth Language Program. Um, and so I just, uh, I just want to try this and give you a little snippet of what this looks like and what the outcome is for a, an event like that. Okay, Dwayne Toma, I'm Bolewes, UJ Alzibaye, I'm Bolewe Nali Gizibetiali. My name is Dwayne Toma. I am from Pleasant Point uh, in Alzibaye, and I'm really glad to be here uh, to share with you some of the passive party words. Well, first of all, if you think about the landscape there, the area in which it is, it's accessible, it's wide open, you can see people coming, you see people going. It's really, it's really plentiful there. There's a lot of clams there. There's, there's a lot of resources there. That's why they picked that spot. Because it's very plentiful there. This the difference is they didn't act like they owned it. Okay? We occupied that. Okay? We shared it with others. Okay? That's the important thing. We shared it with others. Communal. Communicating with other people. Through shells. Through different ways of communicating. Sharing the resources. When they used to get the resources, they'd bring it to the village and everybody would share it. Everybody. No one would go hungry. Nobody. All communal. Everybody looked out for each other. Everybody. Everybody had a role. Everybody had a responsibility in our community. From all the way to look, our people, but most so we know, know, it's always holistic, okay? Everybody is, it's inclusive. Even in the word, most so we know, know, when I say it to you, it's like including you, all of you. No one's left out. Most so we know, know, our people. Let me give you uh, some ideas like um, uh, Maniku. That's an island. Manik is an island. Okay. Um, Zubeg. Okay, that's how you say the ocean in our language. Is Zubeg. Zamagwan. Zamagwan is water. Zamagwan in our language is water. Where is Sisuk? Those are animals. Where is Sisuk? Dokme. Dokme is the land. Dark name is the land. I go, way of Sisuk is all the animals. I went out on 
to first hunt, right? And I, I'm not much of a hunter, but I, I wanted to hunt. So I, I, I killed the animal. I, 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 uh, I, I said a prayer. And I, and I thank the creator who live in each and every school, Hollywood, where this is, is he me a little bit? Thank you for giving me this, this animal. I pray for the animal. But I'll be honest with you, I really felt guilty about it because I, I, I really didn't like the idea of killing anything. Okay? But I knew I was going to eat it, so I was okay with it. But that was the last time I, uh, I went hunting. <laughs> Kichi Mida Hutman. Kichi Mida Hutman is respect. Kichi Mida Hutman. Kichi Mida Hutman means Kichi means great. Okay. Kichi means great. Ida Hutman. It's almost like what I'm thinking. Think great. It's almost like think great. When I talk to you, I gotta think great. Think great when I talk to you. Does that make sense? It's called respect. Connecting with you. Respect. Respect. Kichi Mida Haraman. You think highly of something, someone, no matter what it is, whether it's the earth, Kichi Mida Haraman, Kichi Mida Haraman, Kichi Mida Haraman. You think highly of whatever it is. Kikwus, your mother. Me ducks, your father. Musums, your grandfather. Nukmas, your grandmother. So the video um, was created. There were three, several videos created um, by the students who uh, participated in the field school. And um, as I mentioned, those videos will uh, be used in the Passamaquoddy community to support language learning. And so I think this piece of it for um, the University of Maine and for the Passamaquoddy community really uh, em emphasizes the importance of giving back um, and making sure that uh, the work that we do uh, here at the University of Maine and how we bring up, uh, uh, you know, archaeology students is one that em embraces kind of this give back kind of um, uh, philosophy that really does go along with um, indigenous archaeologies. Um, and so uh, I think overall the, the program was a success um, and uh, we have none of this is ever done in a vacuum. And so we have a lot of um, uh, support and some good partnerships. And, you know, it, uh, the Maine Coast Heritage Trust um, and the current landowners provide us with access uh, to the location. Um, and of course, uh, Donald Soctoma at Passamaquoddy Tipo has been wonderful, um, as has, um, uh, you know, University of Maine, which really is has been committed to funding this kind of initiative. And um, that's one of the important things I think we need to remember is that we're able to sustain this kind of um, approach over the long term. We don't have to um, uh, really wait for the next grant to come in or there, um, I think as long as the University of Maine is committed to it, um, then we can continue this kind of work that benefits um, our students um, as well as uh, Wabanaki communities. And so uh, I just wanna wrap up with some conclusions. Um, the Holmes Point West site documents roughly 3000 years of Passamaquoddy engagement with Machias Bay. Um, and uh, they are um, stewards, caretakers and engaged uh, participants in the research that we do um, there. Um, Passamaquoddy participation in this research demonstrates um, indigenous agency and um, knowing that these places um, are threatened and fragile, um, it's uh, their way of kind of responding to some of those uh, climate change impacts by 
taking the information they can get from these places and building healthier, stronger communities through culture. Um, the indigenous archaeology's framework that we use here supports resilience to climate change impacts, and um, it really exemplifies the utility and value of uh, community engaged research. And with that, my references, I will um, stop sharing. And uh, I'd like to just take a moment to think about or, or discuss some of the themes that we've talked about here. We had some really wonderful presentations and it really does my heart good to see such great um, young scholars coming up and, and doing some really uh, amazing community engaged work. Um, I think a few of the themes that I noticed uh, or that I, I made note of uh, um, that ran through most of our discussions are um, uh, epitomize kind of the philosoph philosophical framework that indigenous archaeologies um, uh, abides by, and that is, you know, working with and for. Um, the, some of the other types of um, Themes include uh, breaking with conventions. For example, um, very often many of the presentations um, in the work that you all are doing break with some of those conventions uh, that are typical for archaeology. And, and you're doing new things, and and it's not the same old. It's not your your uh, or not our. Um, it's not the same archaeology as it was say 30, 40, 50 years ago. It's very different. Um, and one of the other themes that I noticed was that um, we all kind of move beyond the academic um, spheres and um, look towards multiple ways of knowing. And I think um, that is key. And, you know, I think we have to kind of uh, put aside, you know, this notion that we're the experts um, and uh, allow for space for uh, indigenous peoples and, uh, and community members to um, uh, show their um, uh, uh, connection to place through their knowledge. Um, we're all recentering our research. Uh, it uh, seems like um, we are focusing heavily on putting the community at the center of um, everything that we're doing, which is, um, it's very different than coming from the outside in. And I think um, uh, it's, it's not as extractive as, uh, as it has been. Um, Archaeology has had a bit of a history there being kind of extractive. And I think the work that um, all of the scholars are doing here really does recenter it in a way that is um, non-extractive. Uh, community participation um, is a, a key theme throughout all of these. Um, I think uh, it's one thing to have uh, community members at the table um, in terms of uh, uh, information, but for many of us, um, they are part and parcel of our research design. And that's really important. Um, I think also that uh, we see a lot of um, emphasis on integrating local knowledge um, in ways that, again, are not extractive. And so our work is not, um, our work with community is not with the goal of getting information about what we're doing uh, so much as. Um, uh, acknowledging the knowledge and allowing for that knowledge to contribute to the projects in ways that are uh, meaningful for communities. And so again, we're trying to get away from that extractive kind of uh, methodology. <clears throat> and uh, we all are, seem to be working towards bringing the past and the present together. Um, and I think archaeology tries to do that, um, but we tend to be very uh, uh, deliberate in how we do that through these, um, these uh, different projects and different research um, approaches. And so I think um, bringing the past and the present together uh, 
can be healing very much for um, uh, communities, particularly indigenous communities. And then the final thing um, that is really clear from all of these is um, this um, awareness of our positionality and understanding how we as um, scholars, be it uh, whether or not we're from within the community or from outside, recognize that we our, our positionality uh, has um, uh, influence over our research and um, we tend to be very, uh, everyone seems to be very mindful of that and aware of that in our research designs are integrate that notion of positionality in, into, um, into our work. And so I think um, all in all, you all are doing wonderful things. And um, I think we have some um, common goals and I'm optimistic that, you know, 10 years from now, we'll be seeing, you know, many more types of these projects um, and they'll become more commonplace and what they're, they're getting there. I've seen a lot of change in the last 20 years or so, so we're getting there. But thank you again. Um, it was a treat to really, um, and a pleasure to work with you all on this. And so I guess I will turn it back over to David or Catherine. You can turn it over to me. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for summarizing all of that. Um, I'm Catherine West. I'm in the anthropology department and the archaeology program at BU. And I want to thank you all so much for sharing your work and especially for sharing your personal stories with us. It's been incredibly inspiring to listen to all of you. Um, and I want to just pick up where Bonnie left off and continue her discussion of positionality. I'm reading in the Q&A and the chat as you're going, and there have been a lot of really excellent questions there about that topic in particular. Um, one person asks if you have ever been refused access to information, even if you are an insider um, researcher. And another has asked specifically about the positives and negatives. Um, Bonnie and Wade, you both talked about doing ethno um, archaeology with your families, for example, are there positives and negatives that have come out of that personal experience for you? Um, so I'm thinking of those questions when I ask more broadly, in your experience, um, what might be some of the challenges that are faced by both insiders and outsiders doing archaeology in indigenous communities? And do you have any insights into those challenges that you might be thinking about now? So we can go in the order that you spoke um, if you want to. If you want to pass on the question, just say so and we'll move on to the next person. But to remind you, it was Daniela, Adriana, Wade, Caitlin, and Bonnie. So Daniela, if you want to pick up first. Thank you, Catherine, for these questions. Um, uh, I think I will focus on, I answered one of the questions uh, more specifically about my relationship as having uh, married into the community. So um, I think my answer there in the chat. And I, I'd like to pick up on the question about um, refusal and um, navigating that inside an outsider. Um, and in my case, being an outsider to the, to the community in which I work. Um, so in this, in a few, one example I'm thinking about is not so much around oral histories or story storytelling, but in the case where um, landowners will refuse access to um, sites that are on their properties. And this is, can be pretty common. Um, and there was one example where there was a funerary structure. Um, and the one first year that we went, um, I didn't know this, and but the person who let us have access to the place was just the housekeeper. Um, and then the next year, um, we wanted to do the aerial drone photography around the site. Um, and at that point, it was the actual landowner who was there. And they did not want us there um, to access the, the structure. So um, in this case of refusal, it's um, I the most clear answer is just to respect that. And then we just didn't study um, that specific structure up, up close. Um, and I think that's probably maybe some of the ideas that um, my colleagues here have is to just really be respectful of that. Um, and there's other places to work and um, there's plenty of projects that can be done. And I think there could also can be a lot to write about, about this politics of refusal and think about that rather than focusing on the outcome or the goal or of having access to all this information. It's kind of, I guess, a, a colonial mentality wanting to go in and, and, and just have access to all of it. Um, so um, I won't take up too much more time. I'll turn the rest of the questions over to my colleagues. Thank you for that question. 
Yeah, thanks for that question. In my case, it's very similar to Daniela's uh, story uh, because we had uh, various meetings and uh, discussions before with land owners uh, in which the archaeological sites are located and uh, we consult these land owners in through various uh, meetings previous to the archaeological mapping and my presence at the my presence as a foreign uh, non-indigenous person from the city that represents all these uh, threats, historical violence, and uh, you know, extractive industry, uh, was a cause to refuse that original uh, authorization to map the the sites in their uh, in their properties. So that pushed me to define, you know, my position as an outsider and what what does it mean uh, a woman young women mestiza from the city conducting uh, the mapping project although i had all the credentials of the uh, the ancestral authorities that invited me to do the mapping program so i think that's very important to to question all the dynamics and all the colonial uh, legacy that archaeology has, because people immediately uh, associated me to the uh, mega projects that are uh, doing uh, mining and hydroelectric plants uh, with the mapping project. So, yeah, so my answer as an outsider is to be reflective uh, about all these issues, you know, uh, and that's why intersectionality, it's a good tool, a good, a good uh, framework to, uh, to bring all the, the power, all the powers that raise class, gender, nation, and so on, uh, can uh, mixed and you know uh yeah so that is my answer thank you i guess i'll chime in here with a, a couple of statements um for the i think for the question of, of refusal it's actually I, I think quite interesting right i think the the obvious thing is as of people are saying is to respect the wishes of those you're working with and in my case working with family um for a bulk of this right there was another sort of added element to this um where it wasn't so much refusal to share with me but my refusal to share with everybody else right and there's you know i think there's there's that final there's there's that aspect of the refusal process as well and i think that's kind of the the one that archaeologists can have a lot of difficulty with or researchers in general right it's to sort of put your ego aside put your your goals aside and 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 tell yourself that this is something that's meant for me for my family for those that are part of this conversation and not for others and so not to to share that and that i think is in some ways a little different from the informant or your inter whatever you want to call the person you're working with refusing but it puts the, the other aspect of refusal in this case puts the emphasis on the researcher themselves and to accept to, to make these decisions and, and to respect the people that they work with in that way and so there are definitely some things like that um, that i've you know experienced the the time i was at home and talking with my my, my relatives about a lot of these questions um, you know, and then uh, the, the, there was another question about sort of the ethnographic process and um, uh, ethnoarchaeology um, overlap between methods and um, do, 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 do. And actually, and then, okay, so this person, uh, so there, there's a question that just came in too about mentioning that my decision to excavate is it's out of. Um, 
in, in Navajo culture, the, the archaeology has some particular, not, not just uh, sort of tricky aspects because it's linked to this history of excavation in the Southwest. And so when people, when people, I would argue, and this is, comes out of conversations with other Navajo archaeologists and other native archaeologists in general, when people hear archaeology on, 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 on the res, there's three things that, that come to mind. First is Indiana Jones. The second, or you know, Indiana Jones and every other like B movie archaeologist that's ever existed. The second is is um, sort of the history of archaeology in the Southwest, which has focused on excavating um, Pueblo ruins and extracting things and, and taking them to museums and the like. And the third is that to get a home site on the Navajo Nation because of the difficulties in living on a reservation, you need a home site lease, you need an archeological permit, a, a clearance. That process can take a long time and it can stall the whole process, right? And so archeology, span I would argue, has a lot of sort of sensationalist uh, negative connotations in the minds of a lot of people. And I think that when you actually sit down and you have these conversations with the community that you share, or that you know you present that there are ways to minimize impacts, to think creatively, to to ask interesting questions for yourself as a researcher, but for the community as a whole, that don't engage with those sort of negative aspects or are separate, that you illustrate a different way in which work can be done. And I think that's particularly powerful, and I think actually you're starting to see this. Um, uh, more and more and more. There's a, a history, there was a recent article in um, the Advances in Archaeological Practice, I think, uh, about um, here on archaeology, a lot of geochem being done to map sites, uh, people using drones, and a great example of this is uh, Joseph Aguilar, who was San Ildefonso archaeologist who was researching um, the Spanish uh, Reconquista of New Mexico after the Pueblo Revolt. And he did his work all through survey and drone imagery analysis and uh, pulling in the, the, some of those, those aspects of the traditional stories that he grew up hearing to reframe the, the, the narrative of the reconquest of New Mexico. Um, and I th you see this again and again and again uh, more frequently with people that are currently doing this where excavation um, I think excavation should be the last resort. And I think there's a whole other range of techniques. And as you've seen from really everybody else in this session, I think exploring that, promoting that, um, this is what I was hinting at when I went through my slide and talking about sort of innovation and sort of decolonizing where it's not just excavation, but a whole range of other things that can be pulled into this. I agree with your um, idea that excavation is is just one very small part. Um, I think that's something that I'm playing with now too, is that there's so many more questions I still have to ask and I don't need to keep just digging for digging sake. Um, so yeah, I, I like that. And then I was also gonna respond to um, Wade's comment about, you know, like what things are for others and what are not for others and in terms of what we learn and what we engage with when we are in communities. Um, I think that there's a difference in the way we view relationship in a research setting and the way we view relationship in other settings, like relationships with family, relationships with friends. And I think the same level of respect doesn't necessarily always exist in a research setting. And, you know, you think about like how you have conversations with friends that maybe you're discussing something that deepens your relationship with them, deepens your respect with them, deepens your knowledge of them, but you're not going to share that with other people. That's just for your relationship building. And I think the same is true in working with communities that there's a lot of behind the scenes relationship building that is not a part of research and it should not be a part of research. It's about showing who you are. It's about letting them see what your intentions are and, you know, taking time to really slow down and see one another and not necessarily only trying to be very extractive and just take and produce and, you know, publish information. 
Um, I'll be fairly brief on this. Um, I have to tell you a story. I interviewed um, an elder um, as part of a NAGPRA project um, uh, years ago. And we sat down and he was very enthusiastic about, you know, participating, wanted to talk to me. And we got to the end of the session and he says, oh, but you can't use it. <laughs> you know, so we spent this whole, you know, couple hours together and me asking questions and him answering. And, and I was like, well, did I do something wrong? You know, I felt like I had um, uh, offended him or, or something. And he says, no, but I just fear that that will be used against us. You know, somebody will take what I've said and twist it and use it against us. And so um, I think in terms of refusals, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to learn and understand why, where that refusal is coming from. And then what can we do as scholars um, to, you know, maybe alleviate those concerns or change the environment so those concerns don't exist anymore. And so I still have his tape and I will never, I will never release it. <laughs> um, but I do feel like, um, you know, those are moments when we have to look uh, inward and say, and, and think about um, why uh, we're being refused um, something. So there's good reason for it usually. Great, I'm gonna jump in with one other. I want, I'm aware of the time, we're now past five Eastern time, um, but there's one other that I think um, is in the chat uh, by Audrey and it's something that Caitlin and, and some others have, have um, mentioned and it, it really has to do with the power structures of professional archeology span and how we can elevate this sort of work so that it is more pervasive and um, that we can break down some of the barriers to like what Caitlin is saying, there's more time that goes into creating these community connections. And so when it comes to things like granting agencies, um, NSF has the broader impact section of their grant proposals. In my experience, that's gotten better over the last 10 or 15 years of seeing what people do. You know, it used to just be some lip service to student training and, and disseminating locally at some level. They're a little more fleshed out, but I think there's a, a ways to go. They tend to be extremely brief compared to the rest of the, the narrative part. Um, and so, you know, what could we do in those sorts of situations or for say tenure and promotion decisions. So when, when, um, you know, faculty put in their dossiers, there's a lot of time behind certain activities that don't seem to be rewarded uh, by that sort of decision making process at the level I think that we all think they should be. Um, and how can we push more in that direction. I'm not sure if everybody here has comments, um, but uh, maybe we could go in reverse order, Bonnie, if you want to start with it and, and anyone else who, who you think have, have some. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for that, David. <laughs> so, thinking, so, you um, so, you know, we see this all the time where, um, you know, your position is 50% research, 50% teaching, and then you have this whole service component that is it has to be fit in there somewhere. And um, how do you do that? And how do you do that in a way um, that doesn't marginalize that community engagement piece? And so I think you're right. I think part of it is changing um, the structure around how we are evaluated in terms of um, the, the service and the research that we do. So, um, and you know, I, I don't have any clear answers on how to change that. I think a lot of it depends on getting um, people with those philosophies and positions of power where they um, can make decisions about change. And so, you know, I tend to, if I have the opportunity to serve on a board where I can help um, move the needle one way or another, I tend to do that um, because I think that's where you can actually have some influence. Um, but I, I, I do see though that, you know, we are um, 
seeing journals like Archaeology's um, come out more and more as respected kinds of places where we can publish. Um, and, you know, I think it's just, these things take time, change, change is slow in, in kind of the systemic um, uh, overhaul, if you want, for lack of a better word. But um, I do think that, you know, it does depend on who's oftentimes who's in those positions to make those decisions. I, I think for me, a lot of why decolonial and indigenous methodologies have been things that have drawn me to them is because of the community centeredness of, of, of working in groups. And I think that this panel is one example of, you know, creating that change is how in mass, you can show that this is a very powerful way to think. We have, you know, 100 something attendees here that are all learning and thinking in this way. Um, and I think supporting one another and creating spaces for more brainstorming and, you know, problem solving at different levels of, of people who are maybe tenured and others who are going up for tenure and others who are finishing their dissertations. Um, and I think for me, when I was doing my dissertation, um, I, a bioarchaeologist, which has been a whole other like ethical thing, battle to, to think about. But I think that what has drawn attention more to my data is that being able to integrate it with um, this kind of slower storytelling as well. Um, so I think that there is a way to kind of use some of the tools that are seen as valuable and mix them in with these other shifts that we're slowly trying to make in terms of perspective and in terms of the way that we're doing research, the, the speed and the, you know, independent research versus working in groups and brainstorming and coming up with ideas. Um, so those are just some of the ideas that I have. <laughs> so I think in, in my case, right, this is, this is a fascinating question. Um, I, I have a dissertation project that's funded by the NSF, but I had also applied as part of the whole process for to the winter grant as well and was shot down in like the first round. And that one came before the NSF and I used the sort of responses to help modify this, right? But I, I don't think there's necessarily a, uh, that, the, the different experiences, or one of the comments that one of the, the, the Winter Grand reviewer had was that I think some of these things, uh, when you when you have this focus on a community and a particular um, a particular set of questions that are are specific to that community or that experience, it can be. In the case of the Winter Grand, the comment was that this is culture history. We're interested in anthropological research more broadly. And I think that can be um, limiting. But also sometimes like it, 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 it becomes a thought exercise, but you have to go, I think, through some of these, you know, people tell you no, people tell you yes. Um, and you have to tailor your pitches to these different entities. But, it's, you know, honestly, um, when I'm at home, I, in many ways, view my work more as a sort of historical exercise. I, I see archaeology as a really powerful voice for reclaiming native histories. And I, I mentioned that a few times in, in my talk, right? But so much has, if, 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 if our concept of history is often tied to text and uh, all the populations that that focus privileges, when you have people who did not have writing or whatever, um, you fall back on oral histories and material. And I think material is the one thing that's really hard for people to sort of poo poo and sort of brush aside. You know, it puts it in their face that there were people here, there were sites here, people engaged in these activities. And when you can then sort of weave that whole story together, then it becomes much more powerful. The, and I think that process of weaving it together is, I think now there's, there's a, there's a ever increasing body of literature tied into these things to cite, to, to, to build up that sort of theoretical background that can help make these applications uh, for, for funding um, 
perhaps a little more successful um, or you know in, in my case I think it might just represent uh, I'm sorry these early stage dissertation things but sort of working through that has been a, a key um, well, it has resulted in a key lesson for me it's been something that I, I think about a lot just in terms because one of the comments was essentially like he could frame this as doing indigenous archaeology and I was like well the conversation about indigenous archaeology, I feel, is not that you should say you're doing it. You should be putting it into practice and not have to sort of cite the word necessarily. That the work should hopefully speak to that in and of itself. And I think that might be a challenge um, and that needs to be addressed somehow within those sort of funding or granting um, realms. In my experience, I, um, I think the type of work uh, I'm doing requires a lot of energy uh, and time because it's, it's multidisciplinary approach. Uh, and uh, what I mean by this is not just doing the archaeological uh, research to, to know something specific for the post-classic period. Uh, which is, this is something that uh, came to as comments uh, in the first round of the NSF application I, I submitted. And that uh, made me realize of how uh, rigid or how, uh, let's say, conventional archaeology uh, is. Because when I was the first round, I, I, uh, presented my research was all of what I said today based of uh, based on the colonization of archaeology uh, putting this first uh, idea of how are we using the knowledge we are producing and who is using it right so the comments uh, were like this is not archaeology this should be in the outreach and I was struggling with that because the the fundaments of the work I'm doing is not just outreach but it's like the core of my uh, design and the practice I I do still do right uh, and that leads me to uh, the relation the types of relationships we or I uh, I'm not gonna speak for everyone. The types of relationships I I had, I constructed during uh, the time I lived in San Juan Cotzal, that it went beyond the uh, structure of, you know, researcher and the object of a study, but I, I was able and honored to build uh, relationships and learn from uh, many friends. And so I believe that this is something that we have to put and bring like as core of our work. I'll be brief. Um, I, I'm just starting, I haven't even done the main component of my dissertation research yet. So I'm actually just going through the whole proposal writing uh, phase. So I would be very encouraged to hear uh, if how to go about this and how to um, prepare our work while also pushing forward and um, um, emphasizing how important it is to take these kind of approaches. I guess the only comments I would have to add is just representation matters um, and as other people were saying over time, uh, but I'm also always conflicted with like how much representation is effective also when we are in these existing systems and these existing structures. Um, and so um, that's a, a conversation that I've always been thinking about too with my friends is um, how to go about um, this issue of representation and also accountability and with even just from the basic classroom environment to every stage, just bringing in these um, perspectives and the this kind of work um, and um, emphasizing it, I think, is one way, even from um, the student's position to eventually the research position to eventually a uh, faculty position. Um, but yeah, so that's all I really have to, to say about that. Thank you.
thanks all for sharing those experiences. I mean, especially those of you who are ABD and working on the dissertation, um, that tension is troublesome that, you know, of what what's the meaning of research and you know it could be framed as the it's the meaning that fits some social science models that archaeologists you know are, are favor versus meaning for local communities for empowering people for creating citizen scientists for you know getting this out getting more people engaged uh, just seems so critical so i thank you all for the work that you're doing um, I don't know if there's any final comments anyone wants to make. That, if not, then I will. Um, I, can I, yeah, yeah. Wait. Go. I wanted to sort of highlight. Um, I think Adriana's final point about um, you know the archaeology has political implications is something that is worth sort of perhaps just signing off with, right? That that. I think as native folks or people working actively with communities, we all sort of recognize that it's this isn't something that is is uh, what, what's what's the word um, that there are no sort of implications of doing this work, right? That engaging in this is an inherently political process, and, and recognizing that and working to find ways in which our projects could be you know, incorporated into these discussions, I think is really important. You know, uh, I've been getting a few text messages on the side from friends who were really excited about this and talking about Caitlin's work and um, bringing up conversations that I've had with them about food sovereignty on in, in native communities and how where you hear like people talking about these things, um, archeology span doesn't factor in. But if you want information about traditional diet and things like that, this is a really interesting resource for people. And if you start looking at land use, hydrology, um, things at least from a sort of Navajo perspective that are important on the reservation now in a time of drought and a time of changing economics, right? I think there is a lot of stuff that we can um, offer. And uh, I had uh, one of the things that's all this sort of stuck with me for the last uh, couple of years is um, my advisor, Matt Lehman, has an article or a book chapter that I think is, you know, some other folks were asking, you know, what can non-Native or non-Indigenous um, people do? And I had touched on it before, but it's worth mentioning if you just want to sort of see something. He has a book chapter called Giving Up, um, Losing Control in the Service of Descendant Communities in the, in, in the Southwest, where you basically check your desire to do a particular research question at the door and you ask the community what they want. And then you work together to find that sort of collaborative middle ground, or, or maybe it's not a middle ground, but maybe it's this, maybe you actually have shared interests, but it's that conversation. It's the, the potentially the political implications of those things. And I think centering that is, is a really important um, facet of, of all the work that everyone's doing, so. Thanks, Mike. Okay, well, we are a little over our allotted time, but I think this has just been a wonderful conversation. Um, thanks to all our panelists. I hope that um, Bonnie, Bonnie struck some notes of optimism of that we are headed uh, in, a, in a better direction at least. Um, and I hope that continues and I, I hope the connections made here can continue uh, as well. Um, we, of course, have recorded the event, so um, we eventually will, will publicize that through our uh, anthropology uh, social media. Um, you know, please send it along to anyone else who you think might be interested so we can get more of your words out. So thanks to everyone um, and be well. Thank you. Thank you. It was nice working with you all this way. <laughs> Thank you, too. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This was fun. It would be nice to sit down and talk in person, but that's not going to happen. We'll get there. <laughs> the spring, we'll have another one. Late spring. Maybe. <laughs> I'm optimistic on that. All right. Do you want to wait around or just? Here.